Hi. Um, <laughs> so, um, hello. My name is Samble, and the artwork I'll be discussing today is The Palace of Culture and Science, designed by Lev Rudnev and built from 1952 until 1955. This building's symbolism will last for as long as it stands, if not longer, meaning its architect did an excellent job in making it an allegory of communist power. Please allow me to explain why. So, we start in the year 1944. Warsaw has been occupied by the Nazi German uh, forces for five years, and following the failed 63-day-long Warsaw uprising, Hitler orders the total systematic destruction of the city as revenge leaving a sea of ruins. A city that once, once had over a million people is reduced to rubble. However, after the surrender of Germany, time comes to rebuild Warsaw. But now it's the communist puppet government set up by the USSR that decides how it should be done. The leader of the Polish puppet government is Bolesław Bierut, a communist dictator. Stalin, who I'm sure we all know, is also in the picture. By all accounts, they were good friends, joined by a mutual love of communism. And as any good friend does, Stalin offered Bierut a gift of friendship, from the Soviet Union to Poland. The story goes that Bierut was given a choice of either a housing estate, metro line, or skyscraper. And I'm not sure if you've seen the title of the presentation, but let's just say he didn't pick the housing estate, nor did he pick the metro line. And so, this is where the story of the very humbly named Palace of Culture and Science in honor of Joseph Stalin begins. The design is quite important as it needed to become a monument but remain functional. And therefore, Lev Rudnev was picked as the architect. Rudnev is most famous for his design of the Seven Sisters, a series of seven skyscrapers built in Moscow throughout Stalin's reign. In fact, Rudnev was Stalin's favorite architect, and like any proper dictator, Stalin had his own favorite architectural style he used to propagate the power of his regime, socialist realism. Unlike previous projects, this, this, this was required to be a uniquely Polish design to appeal to the taste of the common worker, who often preferred the ordered and formal style of architecture popular during Poland's 16th century golden age especially as it tended to be quite nostalgic for workers uh, and very orderly due to its neoclassical and Renaissance features. Um, therefore, an ordered and formal building was seen as a better option compared to a glass facade of a Western capitalist tower. To design the building, Rudnev traveled throughout the whole of Poland to take inspiration from what was left of the cultural heritage, visiting important historical sites such as Kraków and important cultural institutions. This is the design he came up with. It was rejected for being too Russian, which is a brave thing con to say considering who was funding the project. Rudnev went back to the drawing desk and came back with a much more Polish design, one that took direct inspiration from Polish architecture, including the iconic cloth hall in Krakow, from where the decorative atticism pinnacles were taken from, which line the roofs of the building, or the uh, Grand Theater in Warsaw, Poland's premier pre-war cultural institution, from where its Tuscan 10 Doric column colonnade was directly taken from and used as the entrances to the, to the theaters of the palace itself. This design was much better although some referred to it as the dream of a drunk pastry chef due to its wedding cake architectural form. The construction still went ahead. This, this image shows the scale of the building. Nearly 300 homes which provided temporary accommodation for thousands of people had to be demolished. The construction process only took three years, which for such a colossal structure is quite fast. This is due to over 10,000 builders working on the project, of which 3,500 were sent by the, to, by the USSR to assist as a sign of friendship. They were housed in a new dis city district, coincidentally called Friendship. Bear in mind, much of Warsaw's population still didn't have adequate homes. Additionally, lots of materials were shipped in from all over the communist world as a sign of, can you guess, Friendship. This included 26,000 tons of steel 
and over 40 million bricks, which, would, which meant that every citizen of Warsaw could have received 44 bricks each to help with the rebuilding process. Luckily, Stalin was footing of a bill. This is what the palace looked like when completed. These photos show the juxtaposition of the towering and monumental building overlooking the ruins of Warsaw. This view would have been the norm for Varsovians and showed what the communist state really prioritized. Adding to that effect, the building's facade consisted mostly of bright sandstone slabs which reflected the light, making the building gleam like a beacon upon the rubble, especially as at 230 meters it was the tallest in Europe. Today, it no longer gleams as it hasn't been cleaned in decades. In quite a poetic way, this mirrors the palace's decline as a symbol of gleaming pride once built to an embarrassment that should be hidden after the fall of communism in 1989. That said, even at the time, a lot of propaganda was needed to convince the residents of the city that what they needed was a huge skyscraper, not homes. This campaign worked to an extent as people were immensely proud of the building, but many would just rather not be homeless. There were lots of cultural institutions, such as theaters, cinemas, and even a huge concert hall, where the Rolling Stones had their first Eastern Bloc concert. Sadly, it has been under renovation for the last 15 years, but I do hope my grandchildren will get to see it complete one day. Um, that said, uh, even so, the building's interiors were lavishly decorated, featuring corridors lined with Russian marble. Many of these spaces weren't even accessible to the general public and were instead used to entertain foreign, foreign guests and the elite. But hey-ho, everyone is equal in the communism, right? On the other hand, once construction had finished, the palace acted as a propaganda symbol itself, showing that it was communism that was capable of reaching for the stars. Several sculptures were commissioned for the palace, including famous poles like Copernicus. This was an attempt of the communist state to showcase itself as a successor to previous Polish nations by taking ownership of its historical figures and history itself. Additionally, several relief sculptures were created with allegorical figures depicting the USSR, in this case, bringing Poland peace in the form of a dove. Another shows the gift of technology being handed by the Soviets via an allegorical USSR holding a block of flats. Both of these now decorate stairwells. The palace went through several changes on both the inside and outside. The in honor of Joseph Stalin part of the name was dropped in 1956 following a wave of de-Stalinization. And after the collapse of communism in 1989, a part was briefly turned in, into a casino, probably making Stalin turn in his grave. In 2000, a large clock was added on all four sides of the building, briefly making it the world's tallest clock tower. The palace has always retained its role as a cultural hub, with new institutions such as the Museum of Evolution opening in the last decade. And so, we make it to today. The building still strongly stands in the center of the city, as always visible from nearly everywhere in Warsaw. It has become a symbol of pride, but also of nostalgia, oppression, and the power of communism. Therefore, opinions on the building differ. Some even wanted it destroyed. It is a certainty it did its role of showcasing the influence, strength, and power of the communist regime, as it's still predominantly known as Stalin's gift to Poland. I believe it is a marvel of architecture, combining the monumentality of socialist realism with the history of, po of the Polish Renaissance style, and on a huge scale. Some may say it's monolithically ugly with a Soviet soul, Others may compare it to the headquarters of an evil supervillain, but I believe it is a Polish building through and through. That is a snapshot of Polish history, just like for Polish people. It is a mix of styles, themes, and ideas that came together to create something that was never done before and has not been able, even <laughs> after many attempts, to be destroyed. Um, people change, Warsaw changes, Politics change, Poland changes. Even the history we are taught changes. But the palace of, science, of culture and science remains an everlasting constant, reminding us of our polychromatic past. Thank you for listening.
Thank you very much, Sambor. Um, I presume you visited the building yourself. Yes. Yeah. Can, can you tell us what your first impression was when you, when you went to Warsaw and saw it? Well, I emigrated from Poland when I was seven years old, and um, I never went to Warsaw before that. But to go back to Poland to visit family, we always had to go through Warsaw Airport and then change trains in Warsaw Central Station, which is just outside of the palace. And I remember being about eight years old and, you know, the glass doors opening and just seeing this monolith of brick that dominates the landscape. Even though it is surrounded by glass skyscrapers, it just catches your attention, especially as a child, so greatly. And um, I was terrified of it because, you know, it's huge. I've never seen it before. It's not what you expect to see when you go into a modern European city. And um, in, in a weird way, it has become kind of an anchor point to my identity as a Pole, because it's the building I remember most from my homeland. Um, but yeah, it's just horrifying. Can I, can, thank you. Can I um, just follow up? Do you think there's a different attitude of um, young people compared to older people um, I mean, with regard to this building? Certain. Like, for sure, because, like, my grandmother, for her, it's a symbol of Stalin. For my mother, it is a symbol of communism, and for me, it's a symbol of modern Poland. And even though in the last, like, 20 years ago, many people wanted it knocked down as a symbol of oppression of Stalin uh, and of a dark past, today it has kind of been taken back by the Poles and shown love and shown appreciation and shows that we can take something back that was a gift but that we didn't want, but to make it into something that we do want and that we can treasure and that we can make ours. So. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you.